Honduran President Xiomara Castro received the Thursday the credentials on the ambassador of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Marco Godoy. Russia's defense ministry stressed it has documents and other evidence of Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden's financial links with Ukrainian laboratories intended to create biological weapons. In several parts of Sri Lanka's capital, a curfew was imposed due to strong anti-government protests over energy and the economic crisis. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, Dio Martin, from the Telstar Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. The president of Honduras, Xiomara Castro, received on Thursday the credentials of the ambassador of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Marco Godoy. In this way, Honduras resumes diplomatic relations with the constitutional government of Venezuela presided by Nicolas Maduro. During the ceremony, President Xiomara Castro said that the reestablishment of relations with the people of Venezuela is part of the respect for international law that will characterize her government. On Thursday, Brazil's former judge, Sergio Moro, dropped his presidential bid, a move that narrows the gap between far-right President Jair Bolsonaro and his leftist rival, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Moro left his Podemos party to join the right-wing Union Brazil after having 8 percent of voters support and polling third behind Bolsonaro and Lula in what seems to be a very polarized presidential race. Moro led the massive Lava Jato corruption probe that jailed Lula then joined Bolsonaro's government as justice minister before quitting after falling out with the president. In addition, his reputation was stained after the Supreme Court decided to rule out Lula's convictions due to prosecutorial bias. So far, in the head of Election Day, Lula would get 43 percent of first-round votes, a side of 26 percent for Bolsonaro, according to pollster Datafolia. Hundreds of demonstrators from social organizations camped on a central avenue in Buenos Aires to demand an increase in subsidies and employment. Social organizations in Argentina also rejected the agreement with the International Monetary Fund, which proposes the reduction of subsidies as a requirement to refinance a debt of $45 billion originated in 2018 during Macri's administration. The protests that hampered traffic in the center of the capital began on Wednesday and continued on Thursday. According to Gustavo Aguilera, an official from the Ministry of Social Development, after a meeting with protest leaders, declared they agreed to strengthen food policies and to set up work units to provide tools for cooperatives. And in Venezuela, President Nicolas Maduro met with the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, and they agreed to open an office of the organization in Caracas. The meeting was held at the government palace in Caracas City, where authorities announced the opening of an office of that institution in the Caribbean nation with the purpose of advancing in the agreements established in the Memorandum of Understanding that both parties signed in November 2021. Maduro said that after several days of work, progress was made in the actions to be carried out to strengthen the policies for the protection of human rights in the country. The Venezuelan president also denounced that Venezuela has been the victim of a media campaign promoted by the United States to show a different reality from the one lived by most of the Venezuelan people. We have been engaged in discussions, improved the processes of dialogue, of cooperation, and the processes of complementarity between the prosecutor's office of the International Criminal Court and the Venezuelan state. So the agreements we reached by consensus are very important. Likewise, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court confirmed that the organization will open an office in the city of Caracas as part of the agreement reached in the talks with the Venezuelan government. We have had some constructive and remarkable exchanges in many senses. The parties have agreed, Mr. President, you have also agreed that my prosecutor's office will be able to open or the ICC prosecutor's office will be able to open an office here in Caracas. It is a very important step, very significant and it will allow me to fulfill my responsibilities in accordance with the Rome Statute and to engage with the Venezuelan authorities here. And 28,000 Venezuelans who were residing abroad have returned to their home country through a plan called Back to the Homeland. These people had migrated due to the illegal sanctions imposed by the United States. Let's see what the experience of some of them has been after having returned to their territories. From Caracas, our correspondent Madeline Garcia with the details. This is a modest neighborhood, the Pastoral Parish, to the west of Venezuela's capital. 
Here lives Ruben. He arrived from Peru, where he lived for three years after emigrating like many others. Due to the economic situation of the country, made worse by the illegal sanctions and the blockade of the United States, which hit hard on the people. He left his wife and children, and also the stability of his home. I did not achieve my objectives in the end. I just lost time with my family, and now I have paid the price for it. I have three children with my partner, but as a result of me leaving our relationship ended, and now I'm separated. His aunt, who practically raised him, did not know about his departure until the very last moment. She knew that this experience promoted from people abroad to hurt the country would leave him with a bad taste. But still, she lighted many candles to the saints so he would be protected from xenophobia. And now the important thing is that he has returned. It was quite painful for me and then when he came back he was welcomed. If you go abroad searching for a benefit and when you come back you didn't fulfill your expectations, to me it was not good at all. A little cup of coffee with the smell of family. That's what he really needed. He saved every penny until he was able to buy his ticket, and he arrived at a different Venezuela. The economy has improved, and he earns now almost as much as he did in Peru. When I left, there were lines to buy bread, to buy flour and bread, and now it isn't like that, so it's been a bit of shock. This is different, Venezuela, of which I didn't know about. The number of Venezuelans who have returned by their own means is unknown but the figures of those coming back through the Venezuelan government's plan amount to almost 29,000, who have arrived in over 60 free flights from 21 countries. In that sense, they also used us, because it was not easy even to be illegal in the country. It was very expensive to get the right papers, and that's not the picture they painted us. You had to work very hard. Like him, others left convinced that Venezuelans would be met with open doors, at least that's what he heard from the government's ally to the United States. Madeline Garcia, Telesur, Caracas, Venezuela. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. Russia's defense ministry on Thursday released evidence that proved that Hunter Biden, the son of the United States President Joe Biden, is secretly financing Pentagon biolabs in Ukraine. According to Igor Kirillov, head of the Radiation, Chemical, and Biological Defense Forces of the Russian Armed Forces, Hunter Biden's Rosemont Seneca Investment Fund financed the Pentagon's military biological program in Ukraine. Kirillov also alleged that the labs were part of the American pledge to study the natural immunity of the population to identify the most dangerous pathogen for people in the region. The fund has resources in the amount of at least $2.4 billion, and it has a close relationship with the main contractors of the U.S. military department, including Metabiota, which, along with Black & Veatch Firm, is the main supplier of equipment for Pentagon biolabs around the world. And Turkey noted the possibility of a high-level meeting between Moscow and Kiev at the level of foreign ministers. The foreign minister of Turkey, Mevlid Savazoglu, informed that he is trying to bring together his Russian and Ukrainian counterparts in order to bring closer positions regarding the conflict between the two countries in the Donbass. In this sense, Savazoglu expressed his support to the negotiations and thanked for the confidence granted to his country to act as a mediator. The last meeting between the foreign ministers of Moscow and Kiev since the beginning of the conflict took place on March 10th in the city of Antalya. Members of the Organization of Oil Producing Countries and their allies are holding a virtual meeting on Thursday to discuss strategies related to oil pumping. During the meeting with the presence of Russia, it is expected that issues related to prices and production of crude oil during the month of May be discussed. OPEC is scheduled to hold a ministerial meeting and is expected to reach an agreement to increase its production targets to some 432,000 barrels of oil per day. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which have the greatest share of oil production, are resisting calls for higher pumping and argue that the group should stay out of politics.
On Thursday, representatives of Indigenous Nations of Canada spoke at a press conference after a two-hour meeting with Pope Francis over the scandal of the Catholic Church's role in operating the majority of residential schools in Canada. As we seek to find the truth of what happened to our children, our loved ones, our family and community members who never returned home from the residential schools, it has reminded us that there is still much truth to be uncovered and even greater healing that is needed. It will take many years to assess the impact of the discovery of the unmarked graves. At the Doha Forum in Qatar, participants denounced U.S. and Western countries for actions that caused hundreds of thousands of deaths and displaced millions as asylum seekers. During the Doha Forum, a two-day event in the Qatari capital on Sunday, over 100 politicians, business leaders, and scholars from across the world met to discuss ways to further improve global governance and cope with common challenges. According to participants, Western countries, including the United States, should take responsibility for the human cost of their actions in the Middle East, with their failed interventions impacting on millions of innocent people and causing widespread instability across the region. Current affairs analyst Ashraf Siddiqui also denounced Western media for taking distinctly different approaches towards the Ukrainian situation compared with their stance on the crises in the Middle East, exposing a striking level of double standards. Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, nobody is talking about them. But something little happened in Europe. Everybody seems to be, which is unfortunate, of course it should not happen anywhere, in any corner of, they are all human beings. It should not happen anywhere. But they must realize that um, all these are also human beings and in the same way. But as far as the major countries, uh, the developed countries, the rich countries, they must realize that uh, what is their uh, um, responsibilities towards these uh, human beings. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Hi and welcome back. A curfew has been imposed in several parts of Sri Lanka's capital due to anti-government protests over energy and economic crisis. These protests come at a time of deep economic and energy crisis. Colombo, the commercial capital and largest city of Sri Lanka by population, has requested financial aid from India, China and the International Monetary Fund to be able to pay for basic commodities such as diesel and medicines. Sri Lanka suffered 10 hours of power outages yesterday due to fuel and foreign exchange shortages. The chairman of Public Utilities acknowledges that they have not been able to pay $52 million for a shipment of diesel and power cuts of up to 13 hours are expected. Latest reports say protesters have attempted to take over the pre residence of President Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Angolan authorities announced the suspension of salaries of medical workers who were striking for 10 days for better working conditions. Nearly 6,000 doctors paralyzed their activities after 20 children died in a single day in a pediatric hospital in the capital, Luanda. According to the president of the doctors' union, Adriano Manuel, the deaths were due to a shortage of medicines and medical equipment. In the midst of this situation, the government granted a 6% increase in basic salaries, which was considered insufficient by the health sector. Kenya's top court blocked President Uhuru Kenyatta's bid for changing the constitution. Kenya's Supreme Court ruled Thursday that a controversial bid by the president to change the constitution was illegal, which means a blow for him and his allies ahead of elections in August. Nevertheless, it left open the possibility for reforms, popularly known as a Building Bridges initiative that can be submitted again by parliament or through other means so long as the president is not involved in the changes. Kenyatta argued that the change would make politics more inclusive and help end repeated cycles of election violence. 
The timing of the reforms spurred speculation in recent years that the president might be seeking to remain in power by establishing the post of prime minister as part of the BBI. The second schedule of the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 is unconstitutional for being in breach of Article 10.2 and 87.7a of the Constitution of Kenya 2020 for lack of public participation. Monumental, historic, because for two grounds, the Supreme Court has agreed with the High Court and the Court of Appeal that the BBI bill initially uh, promoted as the Constitution of Kenya 2020 Amendment Bill is null and void. Null and void for the following reasons. One, because it was not a popular initiative. It was not a people-initiated process, but it was one that had been conceptualized and put in place by President Huru Megai Kenyatta and his brother Raila Amolo Dinga. A Syrian-Russian cultural event was held Thursday in Damascus on the cooperation between the two allied nations to restore and preserve Syria's ancient archaeological monuments sabotaged by terrorist gangs. More details in the following report by our correspondent in Damascus, Hisham Bonus. The activity began with a conference organized by the Russian Cultural Center in Damascus, where a documentary was shown about the recent restoration performed by the Russian and Syrian archaeologists of the historic Afka Spring in Palmyra, which dates back 6,000 years, as well as the importance of bringing life back to this millenary Syrian city. A work that seeks to rescue all the vestiges of the city and that the Russian archaeologists claim to continue despite the current Western onslaught that their country is facing. Parmera is a very important archaeological site for us, and this represents a center of all culture and millenary history, which contributes to strengthening steady bilateral relations between Russia and Syria, and I believe that the current events in Ukraine would not affect these relations and would not affect the ongoing archaeological cooperation projects, which I believe, in addition to continue it, would become stronger and more extensive. Let's hope there will be a worldwide collaboration to help complete this joint Syrian-Russian effort to restore Palmyra, which is a historical site that belongs not only to the Syrians, who are struggling to preserve it, but is also part of the human civilization. Under the title Palmyra in the Eyes of the Russians, a photographic exhibition organized by a Russian artist was also part of the event. More than 40 photographs shed light on the serious damage suffered at the hands of terrorist gangs to the various monuments of the city inscribed on UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites. The artist claims to complete the documentation at all the Syrian archaeological sites in order to make it available to the whole world. Syria has a magnificent and authentic history and civilization, and Palmyra is an outstanding part of this history. And what the terrorists did is terrible and regrettable, and I have shown it in my paintings. I hope that with the support of the archaeologists of my country, they can repair all or part of these monuments and vestiges of great value, not only for Syria, but for the whole world. We work tirelessly to restore our archaeological heritage and to record the splendor it had before the beginning of the war, because Syria is the paradise of archaeologists and unfortunately now the foreign archaeological expeditions that used to operate in Syria no longer collaborate with us due to the hostile political stance of their respective governments towards Syria. The Pearl of the Desert was occupied twice in 2015 and 2016 by Daesh terrorists who left their mark of hatred on the city millionaries' Greco Roman ruins before being defeated by the Syrian Arab army and its Russian allies. However, Syrian archaeologists, with the support of their Russian colleagues, despite the difficulties caused by the Western blockade, are making progress in the restoration of the city as part of an ambitious archaeological cooperation project covering all of Syria's historical heritage. With that, we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on the website at Tulsa English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tulsa English, I am Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.